Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on St. Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2021, with your church family at First Presbyterian near Ely. I am glad you are here. Today our focus is on the love of God, shown to us through his Son, through the presence of the Spirit, through the inspiration of nature, and through one another. Let us begin with prayer. Gracious God, on this holiday with chocolates, Hallmark movies, and special dinners, we give you thanks for the overwhelming love that you have for us, especially in times when we feel lost love, love and grief, loneliness, and lack of meaningful earthly relationships. You hear our heart's desire, and we believe you have good plans for each of us. And we thank you for the loving relationships that we do have now and in days gone by. We remember that you created love, and in your forgiveness, you bring peace. This we pray in the name of your dear Son, Jesus, our friend, our Savior, our brother. Amen. For children's time today, for those of young age and for those young of heart, I have a special valentine that I'm going to make for you with this piece of red paper. So I'm going to fold it. Then I'm going to cut it. Then I'm going to open it. It's a valentine in the shape of a heart. Think of this as a heart of love. Now what am I going to do? Cut out a little cross, a little tiny cross. It's in the shape of something that we have here at church in many different places throughout the building, and it is a very meaningful shape for us. The shape of the cross, it reminds us of pain, of death, but more than that, it reminds us that God says, I will take that cross of pain and death and make it into something that is important, that is about life, that is about love, and I will put it in the center of my love so that you will know how much I love you. When we look at God's love, we see the cross cut out in it. We can see the world through it, through the cross. I can see you through the love of God through the cross. God loves you today in your earthly days. God loves you for your eternity and he wants you to be very near his heart. Let us have the pretzel prayer with one another. Put your arms and repeat after me. May the Lord, May the Lord watch, between watch between you and me, you and me. while we are absent one from another. Amen. Amen. Today, our scripture lesson takes us out of the Gospel of Mark into the Gospel of Luke. This is a story that is only in the Gospel of Luke. It is the parable of the prodigal son, perhaps one of the best known and best loved of all of Jesus' parables. And like any good parable, the prodigal son's story cannot just be contained by one um, ex explanation or one interpretation. These words of Jesus take their meaning and their strength from the fact that it is a parable, a story. It invites us in and it asks us to participate in it as well. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, 1 through 3, and then dropping down to verse 11. 
May God bless the reading and the interpretation of his word today. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of the property that belongs, that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and get a fattened calf, and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his elder brother was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the slaves and asked, what was going on? And he replied, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened, fattened calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then the elder son became angry and refused to go in. His father came and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours come, came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today I have three stories about love that will reflect on the parable of the prodigal son and what God's love is like. The first is about fuzzy slippers. The second is about a purple dress. And the third is about Velcro. She was just another executive type. This morning, she's engaged in a top-level meeting and presented to, presenting to her biggest clients a new major plan she's worked on for months and months. 
Her statistics are accurate. Her goals are clear. Her, question, her answers to questions of cost and expected results are handled expertly. Only one thing is betraying the woman's nervous tension as she winds her way through her presentation. The fact that she's playing with her big, white, fluffy bunny slippers and taking them on and off, scuffling them back and forth, even dangling them on the tips of her toes. But no one sees it because it's a video conference. Her office, her conference room, now is in her home. She has conducted this high-powered meeting through Wi-Fi. She can be present with her children in the morning before they go to school. She can avoid the crush of commuter traffic. She doesn't worry about office gossip these days. She doesn't have a concern about being home on time. If she can just make it through this presentation, then maybe she can exhale. The second story is about Rucker and his wife, Pamela, who were driving through a decayed and down on its luck Indianapolis neighborhood when they noticed a taxi cab pulling up in front of a small, shut-up church. As they watched, an extremely elderly woman struggled her way out of the cab and began to negotiate up the steps of the church. She was dressed in her Sunday best, a purple dress that had seen a lot of wear over the years. Concerned, the couple stopped to lend assistance, helping the woman as she was slowly making her way up to the door, only to find that the church doors were locked. It became apparent that the woman in the purple dress had gotten confused and had come to church on Saturday, not on Sunday. So they offered her a ride home, and they found themselves in a neighborhood even more decrepit than the one that the church stood in. And on the way, the woman talked about how she was 92 years old and didn't have family anymore. Her only son had died years ago, Although she was extremely poor and frighteningly fragile, this woman had taken her dwindling resources of money and strength and used them this day to get ready in her Sunday best and pay for that ride in the cab to the church. What impressed Rucker and Pamela the most was the woman's calm acceptance her unshakable trust that everything would be all right. She believed that with all her heart, that God would provide. And she, in her best purple dress, didn't know exactly how that would happen, but she did know that Jesus walked with her every day. The third story is about a little girl in sparkling Velcro fastened sneakers who scuffs her well-worn shoes back and forth and back and forth while she's waiting. Her mommy is late again. She knew that sometimes mommy got busy, but she also knew that sometimes mommy just forgot. Forgot about the time, forgot about where she dropped off her daughter that day, Forgot even that sometimes she was a parent with a four-year-old depending on her, counting on her. And even at her young age, the little girl knew that it was the drugs and the drink that made mommy forget. So they moved often. Mommy would spend the rent money on more drugs and they'd have to sneak out in the middle of the night and find another place to live. The little girl reached down to try to restick the Velcro strap on her left sneaker, half of the fuzzy grip didn't work anymore, so the strap flap flapped open and her shoe fall fell off. That's probably why they were in the garbage where she found them in the first place, but at least they sparkled. The little girl sat quietly on her most recent neighbor's porch and wished her mommy would remember where she was and that she needed her 
to go home. Every one of us has known what it's felt like to be lost. That scary, confused, out of control feeling that takes hold of your heart and squeezes really hard. For some of us, it's a feeling that we encounter only occasionally, like when we are in a city where we don't know the streets, or when we're trying to remember where we parked the car in the parking ramp. But for many, feeling lost is much more of a permanent condition, and trying not to look lost has become the focus of their existence. There's a lostness in the lives of the woman in the white slippers and the purple dress and the girl in the sparkly sneakers. A lostness that might be sometimes camouflaged very well and kept under very tight control. The woman in the white slippers was coping with ever-present fear, frustration, balance, or lack of balance. But not all people can wander out of their lostness without help and support from others. The woman in the purple dress had not lost her faith. It was her strongest support, her center of gravity. It held her solid and secure. She was, however, lost by the community of faith she called her own. She felt lost when she wondered, why is that church door locked? Where are her friends? Who will stop and take her and visit with her? Take her to the store, visit with her. She's been lost from the minds and the hearts of those that she remembers who are not with her anymore. Even by those that she regularly sits with and prays with during worship. She was losing herself and she is alone in her lostness. But she's also not alone in her lostness. Her father had long ago abandoned both her and her mother in a prodigal search for his own way, was lost without moral compass or spiritual compass. Now the addictions that grip her mother's body and soul have plunged both mother and daughter into a directionless void and the little girl has lost her innocent belief that mommy will always be there and mommy will always take care of me. She knows that neither of those statements are true. Her mother has lost control of her life, lost her vision, lost the chance to offer her child a better way and a better hope. And even when they are together, they are lost and vulnerable and alone and fragile. No father and a mother who can't cope this poor little girl not lost like the prodigal son of our story, but in her own way. In these days of ours, that we recognize are not the way that we want things to be, we do still know the church itself is a place for the lost. It is for all lost souls. And these days, the church family has to continue in worship and life and education and fellowship, primarily beyond the walls of the building. We are the people for the lost. We are the people for the lost on the sidewalk, in the neighborhood, during an email message or video call, proclaiming the promise of forgiveness, extending embraces of welcome and acceptance like the waiting father in the, this parable today. When we are filled with Christ's love and Christ's joy, we can't just sit and wait for the slow, hesitant approach of lost ones. Like the prodigal son's father, we need to jump with joy at the sight of lost stragglers journeying slowly into our direction. In the story, he runs to the lost son as soon as he sees him in the distance. He greets him with a hug and a kiss before the son has even arrived, before the son has even repented. This parable has a stern warning that we should look at the angry brother who demands that people feel the right way in his point of view especially when his own ego has been bruised. 
when he thinks that maybe the lost should just remain lost. Thank you very much. Instead, we are called to celebrate. Just as the angry brother is asked to celebrate. Celebrate the lost brother to be filled with joy about it. We are called to do the work of the father. When he asks for rings and robes and sandals, we are to gather them together. We are to put them on those who are lost. We are to do the bidding of the Father when he commands a feast to be prepared and shared. The mission that we have together as a church family is to say to each lost traveler, whether that traveler is lost in making a living or lost in a community's abandonment, in their own mind, in an addiction, in loneliness, in self-absorption, we are to say, come home. Come home to Jesus. So how will this parable end today? Jesus tells it and leaves it hanging in the air. What will the angry son do? Will he rejoice and join the party? Will he do something else? How will these things go now that the found now for the found son, no longer the lost son? The only sure thing about this story is that it shows us the continuation of the father's love for both of his sons. How the father, like God, celebrates the found even before they get to the door. How the father, like God, calls for the angry son to join in with the celebration. It leaves us with a lot to think about today. Praise be to God. announcements today. A reminder that um, fellowship time will be on Zoom following the service and then Sunday school will begin around 10 30 uh, with some additional activities today celebrating St. Valentine's Day. Uh, 
This week we have Ash Wednesday service at 7 o'clock online, and ashes will be available uh, here at the church afterwards. Um, and I will uh, use a clean medical glove for the imposition of ashes if you come by for that. If that time frame doesn't work for you, please let me know, and I, will, I can meet you here uh, at a different time more convenient for you. Next Sunday begins the first Sunday of Lent, and uh, we will begin a series based on Adam Hamilton's The Walk, and this is a journal that there are copies available um, under the church mailboxes if you'd like to use this in your devotion this year during the season of Lent, leading us up to Easter. That will also be our focus of our Sunday school and worship theme. Um, and next Sunday, also being the first Sunday of Lent, we will share communion with one another. So if you're sharing it um, at home, um, have an element for, of bread, have an element of uh, drink, and be ready for communion. If you are here outside, we have the package, packaged um, communion sets available. As we bring our thoughts and concerns today to God in prayer, we remember those who are working so hard and have worked so diligently over the past almost 12 months, just about 11 months now, facing our um, worldwide uh, pandemic and difficulties that have come out of that. And we give praise to God for their endurance, their patience, their skills, uh, their abilities. And uh, we praise God, even in dark and difficult days, um, to knowing that um, our faith leads us day by day and things are getting brighter in our world. Let us pray together. Gracious God, you are like the father to the prodigal, the lost son, and you are like the father to the obedient, the angry son. Thank you for your love, your forgiveness, your presence, your strength. We are grateful that you meet us in our needs. We are grateful that you are working on us to be more patient, forgiving, and loving. Things that we don't often like to do or to be. Thank you for your love, which is meeting the deepest needs of those around us and transforming their lives. Thank you for your healing of those in physical and mental, those in economic, and those in emotional pain. Thank you for your presence in the days of red and pink, in the days of gray and blue, in the days of life and today. Thank you for those we love with sincerity and care. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who while he was with us on this earth, taught us to pray, saying these words, which we say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And take with you this blessing. May the Lord watch over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and and forevermore. And all God's people say, Alleluia. Amen. Amen.